Welcome to Public Affairs Roundtable, a discussion of current events in the nation and around the world and how they affect the people of Indiana. Here's your moderator, Larry Law. Americans armed with their constitutionally guaranteed free speech have always prided themselves in being able to question, even doubt, their public officials. But somewhere along the lines between the lies of the politicians on Pennsylvania Avenue and the admin on Madison Avenue, somewhere that healthy skepticism turned into some kind of hardened cynicism. That today perhaps we are in what some have called an age of disbelief. Today on Public Affairs Roundtable we'll talk about this credibility crisis with our experts Angie Cooksey from the Department of Philosophy at Ball State University, Catherine Howard, faculty director of the Better Business Bureau here on campus, and a member of the marketing department at Ball State, and John Rouse, executive producer of Public Affairs Roundtable, and a member of the political science faculty here. John, age of disbelief. Uh, can we just start out by blaming the politicians for uh, making us all doubters, perhaps cynics? The age of disbelief really began, I believe, in the 1960s when there was a real questioning of authority. So all authority has been questioned, the church, the government, uh, institutions in general, educational institutions. So it's something that's been ongoing for about 20 years. Essentially, in the last uh, 20 years, we have become a society, a, 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 a society, if I can say the word, of institutions. So institutions perhaps will lie, but people will not. So once people begin as being honest individuals, but once they enter institutions, they become institutionalized. In a sense, they be become in a position where they could lie. A second thing I think we could emphasize is that what has happened in the last 20 years is that a society has also become a process. So certain, every value in a sense is equal, at the beginning at least. So it is a process. For example, for the last several weeks we have been looking at the presidential process. So the, the process becomes, becomes the result. No longer are, are presidential candidates are selected by uh, certain politicians. It is a process. So I would look at two words. First of all, we have become institutionalized and we have to raise questions about the philosophy of institutions. And number two, it is a process. And number three, the process is indeed the result. Kathy, the name B Better Business Bureau came up in your introduction. Certainly business is not immune from a lot of doubts and a lot of cynics, a lot of criticism. What do you find? In the research that I have conducted, I've seen that there are trends where the esteem, or as we're talking about, the lack of esteem, esteem of business goes through cycles. Uh, before World War I, when monopolies were being broken up, business was looked upon favorably. Then the Great Depression hit, and they were blamed for many ailments. Then after uh, World War II, again, business was popular because of the wealth and the conveniences that it brought to the society. And then, as John said, the, the social change in the 60s and the 70s hit, and we've seen all kinds of problems popping up. Uh, business certainly is not the only factor, the only institution, as we're talking about. There are other institutions everywhere from professional sports, but business certainly has had its share of problems. Angie, is this a serious ethical question for the 80s? Is it the question of the 80s? Uh, where, does it, where do you find us? I'm amazed, actually, that so many uh, definitive experts are pointing to this notion of lying in corporations, lying in government, as a problem atypical to the 20th century, and more specifically, a problem that we're seeing come to the forefront in 1987, the year of lying dangerously. Uh, these kinds of practices have been going on and have indeed been commonplace since the beginning of mankind. I would imagine the first cavemen who tried to dupe their neighbors uh, into some kind of fictitious hunt <laughs> were maybe our first liars, our first cheaters, our first crooked businessmen. So I would initially respond by saying that I am surprised at the naivete of the American psyche to think that this is a problem that is new. It is indeed very old. And uh, although that may not actually address the problem, I think to keep it into uh, in perspective in this way is critical as we begin to analyze lying in 1987. And perhaps instead of asking, how did this all come about, if we understand it's been here 
there for quite a while. We might want to ask questions. Why is this manifesting itself in the way that it is in 1987? What makes 1987 unique as the year of lying dangerously? Sure, what, what makes it new is the fact that we have so much good videotape well, for television now that we can show a politician six months ago and a politician today simultaneously and catch I really him in think lie. that's a compelling point, Larry. I think that if uh, lying in 1987 is definitive in any way, it's because it's just so visible. Uh, it is so marketable. Media is so prevalent that even if we don't want to hear about deceit and lying, we're going to hear about it anyway. Uh, these kinds of practices that we're bringing into the political limelight and into the corporate limelight are practices that were previously pigeonholed or put in the closet or talked about in smoky rooms behind closed doors. The difference in 1987 is that the public demands disclosure. Mm -hmm. The result of that is this disclosure brings discontentment, a uh, disillusionment. Now, now Angie, you, you have made the mistake of, in a sense that you're unconscious of this is 87 and, and, and this is not a lie. I mean, perhaps we're, and, and that's my point, oftentimes we cannot tell whether somebody is incompetent or are they lying. And I don't mean to say that you're incompetent, but I'm saying that mistakes do happen. And so when mistakes happen, people all of a sudden think perhaps somebody's lying to them when it's really a mistake. A couple points I would make on, on your commentary. First of all, there's a, it is certainly true that this country has been the home of the whopper. We, I mean, you know, we have mm -hmm. the, the used car salesmen, people, uh, we have the snake oil salesman, so we have a history of the whopper in a sense. I mean, we have been known as a country that lies from time to time in terms, so this th is a thing of the past. But let me make my point. This is now institutionalized lying. And when you have institutionalized lying, and say if you have decisions made by committee, it's very difficult to pinpoint the accountability. So maybe the difference is in, the, in today's world as opposed to uh, 20 years ago when you had a sense of authority and you had somebody at the top and you knew where the accountability was at the top. Now you have institutionalized lying perhaps among equals. Institutions are composed of people, John. Institutions are those who constitute institutions and I think you make a valid point that accountability uh, may be an integral part of this entire question. Perhaps lying is easier in corporations, in institutions, in political governmental machinery because accountability is very hard to pin down. However, I must still submit that although we see this as a large picture, that large picture is made up of lots of points and dots called people. And people still have a conscience, co a collective conscience of a corporation is, is a collectiveness of individual consciousness. So I can't completely subscribe uh, to your notion that lying is on the upswing by virtue of its being born in institutions where accountability is a problem. Not that I will say accountability uh, doesn't contribute tribute to the prevalence of lying, but I certainly don't think that's going to get us off the hook. Now lying, of course, implies that somebody had some uh, underlying motive to get something done and told a mistruth. Now are the sorts of things that President Reagan does, perhaps a bit of bad memory, perhaps uh, a, an inability to tell between uh, what was real and what was a movie uh, has been documented. He seems to get confused between reality and, and fantasy. Uh, is that lying or is that merely uh, uh, bad memory? Is that merely wanting to recall what you want to recall? I would submit there are several different kinds of lying. We're familiar with some and perhaps not so familiar with others. There is, of course, the little white lie, a lie wherein we know the circumstances of a situation, but we use or have at our disposal something like hyperbole or some other uh, literary utensil that we might use to stretch truth or withhold truth. There is blatant lying, uh, of which we may be guilty at some points, wherein we know the facts of the situation and we, uh, by intent and almost with a malicious neglect that information that we have and move our uh, comments in an opposite direction. And then, of course, there's unintentional lying, wherein we simply did not know, as you indicate. We make a mistake because we don't remember or we are not familiar with all components of a situation. And I think we need to be clear in this delineation and recognize different types of lying as they occur. You mentioned President Reagan. And I'd have to stop and think for a few days about which kinds of lying he's been guilty of, what instances he's guilty of these certain kinds of lying, and how all of that fits in to the big picture. We're not just talking about lying here. I think we're talking about 
illegal campaign contributions, we're talking about income tax evasion, we're talking about companies that make shoddy products. All of this goes to shape our opinion of these institutions. Uh, when, when you talk about the Reagan administration, I think you have to look at Ed Meese, our Attorney General. Here is a person, the supreme lawmaker of the land, who, while he hasn't been convicted of anything yet, he certainly has uh, an air of uh, investigation around him, and this is someone who really should maintain themselves in the highest of ethics. You know, I, I think you have to have, as you say, a sensitivity to these kinds of ethics, and it's been charged more than once that the current administration does not have a sensitivity, at least in terms of ethics. But, but let me get back to, uh, uh, to a question uh, for you, Kathy. And isn't, in a way, the phrase corporate ethics, isn't that kind of a contradiction in terms, corporate ethics, that private corporations really haven't had any sense of community ethics uh, in the history of this country? Oh. Or is that too, too, <laughs> too, 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 uh, too much of a harsh charge towards business? I'm not sure how to answer that. I can go back to specific cases. Let's look at some cases that happened this week. Inland Steel Company in Indiana has agreed to pay a $100,000 penalty for uh, alleged violations of the Clean Water Act, according to the Environmental Protection Agency. Probably the largest uh, settlement to date, Bell Helicopter Textron has agreed to pay the U.S. government $90 million. And in both of these cases, Part of the plea bargain is that they have not admitted any wrongdoing, and they will not admit any wrongdoing. In the helicopter case, uh, they call the $90 million an accounting problem. Uh, even though there was evidence of uh, shredded documents, altered uh, computer data, uh, covered up evidence of overbilling. So I think what we have to look at are specific cases, and probably the, the business response, and in fact the business response is that too much has been made of certain companies, and it has overshadowed many of the other fine institutions that we have. What is the mentality of that, that you, legally we didn't lie, legally we didn't do anything wrong, but we'll agree to pay this huge settlement, uh, even though legally we did, we're not responsible for it, and we maintain our innocence. Uh, who are they fooling? Are they fooling anybody? I think that's a complex question that you ask. I think that it hinges on the notion of compromise. I think many times corporations will take steps of compromise as opposed to getting involved in a very expensive and perhaps an embarrassing lawsuit uh, to avoid bad PR, uh, to uh, get into a better kind of public relation, and an air of cooperation rather than an air of obstinance. Uh, and, um, uh, instead of coming head on with these charges, uh, what these corporations many times will attempt to do is work with these charges and work within the confines of remedy in an attempt to act in good faith. Going back to John's initial question to Catherine, uh, business ethics, is this a contradiction in terms? If we look at the theoretical definition of the word ethics, I think we're entirely in bounds when we talk about corporate ethics. Ethics means merely relationships uh, between actions of people. And when you say the word ethics, although the generic connotation is that you're automatically talking about good and bad and right and wrong, I don't think you want to make that quantum leap. I think any kind of an organization which drafts guidelines, whether these be uh, spoken guidelines, written guidelines, or they're merely unspoken, uh, the kind of the substructure of the organization, I think any kind of corporate structure can own a set or code of ethics. Yeah. See, we live in a very laissez-faire society w where people are supposed to be active. Point number two. It is also an issue of accountability if a, if a corporate firm is doing something that is not moral or even illegal. It is up to the citizen to make that complaint, to be an active citizen, to say, hey, corporation, you're doing something wrong. Now, that phrase, wrong, there is nothing, you know, in terms of accepting the value position of right and wrong. Today, we don't think of right and wrong. I mean, that has a moral connotation to it. We think in terms of incorrect and correct. So in our, pluralistic, in our pluralistic society, where anything goes in a sense, where the, the, the people who are the most active in terms of their value system, whatever it is, tends to win out. So it's a matter of, 
are we going to get into the process and do we believe enough in our values, whatever they are, to become active? I think that's a good point. I think that you get into almost, to put it very simply, a chicken and egg argument. Uh, do we draft individual morality and impose that upon, upon corporation and other social structures, or do corporations and social structures act, and then we ask ourselves, is this good or bad? Which way does this happen? Do we set up the paradigm, or does the paradigm emerge? And once again, you know, not to use these horrible historical generalizations, but this question is as old as the Socratic dialogue, the Euthyphro. Socrates himself asked the question, how do we come to notions of good and bad and right and wrong? Are they divinely inspired? Are they inherent? Do we know them? Absolutely. Or do we rather go out in the world and act and then those paradigms reveal themselves? I think that's something we need to take a look at in terms of corporate, political, governmental ethics as such because it has bearing on how we judge the various actions of these institutions. Kathy, do business schools, colleges now emphasize ethics in their classrooms? Is, is this much of a concern? Not only do business colleges emphasize eth ethics, but also businesses themselves are bringing in consultants to preach ethics to their employees. I have had many uh, business co uh, courses that have talked ethics, at least in part of the course content. I think they should do more. I think there should be a course called Business Ethics, and uh, I think that would be very good for the young people that are coming up that uh, are caught up in this uh, lying deceit just as everyone else is. It isn't lying really some of the price we pay for a free society, though? Uh, in fact, we have our economic system, a capitalist system, which is built on competition, which is built on marketing and selling yourself and making yourself better our political system much the same way, a competitive political system where you try to make yourself feel better. And we do that throughout school too. It's just not a, you did well, it's did you do better than Johnny or did you do better than Janie? And uh, who was first in the class and who was second? And it's a very competitive society we're in from the top to the bottom. And, and, and if we lie a little bit well, in our, we've talked about the marketplace of ideas. Well, the truth will eventually out once, it, it, once the uh, falsehood is overwhelmed. But isn't really lying sort of a, a byproduct of a free society? It's something we have to live with? I think that's a point well taken. We certainly live in an environment super saturated with competition, as you note. And this certainly is a, a, a fine breeding ground uh, for human activity like lying, among other atrocities that human beings will manifest in their attempts to climb ladders uh, to accomplish their particular goals, whether they are business goals or political goals. Um, I'm going to save my last comment for the end of the show. I could introduce it here, but I'll hold back uh, and simply say that although we live in an environment conducive to this kind of behavior, I think it will be the case that in the final analysis, human nature uh, with its inherent strength and adaptability can overcome this inclination to lie. I, you know, I, I think that's true. You know, as you look at resumes, as we see our own resumes, we, we, we expect resumes to put the best foot forward. Now we would say that is not lying, but you know, what is the distinction between the best foot forward and lying? As we look at the presidential candidates, we know that in terms of the marketplace of ideas, it's very important for, for candidates to be questioned. And, and of course, uh, uh, that has especially been the case, say, with Pat Robertson in terms of his background. Some people believe that Jesse Jackson is not being questioned thoroughly enough because he is black. So, so the, the issue of, of making sure that you have the accountability factor in terms of uh, uh, opposition, in terms of the questioning process, I think is very important. But, but uh, sometimes there is not quite a clear distinction between putting the best foot forward and lying. Going back to those different kinds of lying and have the discretion to know yeah. the differences between them. Yeah. In politics, you see this in the negative commercial, the negative <coughs> campaign ad. I think here you have to look at what is, is actually the background of the person that they're talking about and what is just out and out lies. Now, the, the problem with the negative campaign ad is that it's unregulated. Is this an industry that's going to regulate itself? Does it feel any ethics or can someone go out and say whatever they want to say about the uh, opponent and get away with it because the election is over 
and uh, may the, the best person win. Well, that's where we allow the marketplace of ideas, uh, the free market of ideas to uh, settle out. In fact, if you tell a lie and if we let all opinions go out there, then the lie will be overwhelmed by, by the truth. The truth will eventually out. But I would think this would make this, during the middle of a presidential campaign, a period when Cynicism is probably at its highest level. If we've got a cynic meter, it's probably very near the top now because you have a lot of politicians who, who perhaps want to avoid the truth. And we talk about <laughs> deficits and they say, sure, we can cut spending. I've got plans when, in fact, it's going to be difficult for anybody to do it without raising taxes. But you don't talk about raising taxes in a campaign. And I think politics particularly uh, contributes to a high cynicism. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, you know, let me say a very kind word for politicians, by the way. If politicians are getting money under the table, who's giving them the money? It's the businessmen, because the businessmen want to buy off the politicians, because the politicians set the rules for society, and then those of us in, as private entrepreneurs, we implement the guidelines of the rules. So whether it's Watergate or whether it's the Iran-Contra problem, it seems to me that the politicians oftentimes get a bad rap because if they are making deals, they're making deals with citizens, individual citizens. But we're a free society and we choose not to regulate too closely <laughs> those kinds of things. Campaign contributions, for example, uh, yeah, individual and corporation uh, contributions are limited, uh, but still uh, it's pretty wide open. Well, let's take the example of the snail garter. Down there in Tennessee, the point here is that you have, if, if you have to have a piece of legislation to protect uh, the snail darter, the snail darter is already in large difficulty. He's in a hell of a lot of trouble, so to speak. The same trouble, the same problem if you have to have legislation to prevent <coughs> lying or to protect ethics, ethics is already in a heck of a lot of trouble. So, so I'm not sure that you can legislate morality from that point of view. I mean, you can have the, you know, what is the role of the family? You know, what is the role of the family? What's the status of the family? Which is another issue, of course, in terms of teaching young kids in terms of telling the truth. Now, sometimes you can perhaps have an overabundance of emphasis upon, now, kid, you tell the truth. No matter what happens, you tell the truth. But maybe we've gotten to the extreme from that point of view in this day and age. But they get in school where you have your teacher who might be on the picket the next day because they're involved in collective bargaining and they have this bargaining strategy and maybe they're fudging their position a little bit. Uh, so uh, is anybody ever uh, involved with the truth 100% of the time or, or is it all a deal? Are we all uh, sort of cutting the best deal we can? Uh, I want to speak to the cynicism that was brought up earlier a few comments ago in so far as We've, be, we've become a society that's super saturated with cynicism. I don't think this is entirely bad. I wouldn't go running for the pail of water to put out the cynical fire. I think cynicism uh, gets our gumption up and uh, really uh, sets afoot our intellectual initiative, gets us looking, if you will, uh, underneath the fingernails of politicians and underneath the beds uh, of our evangelists and various other places we think we might be able to uncover. Uh, various truths. And once again, I don't think this scrutinization is entirely negative. Um, from pieces I have read and research I have done in and about lying, uh, I would say that the truth telling is so valuable uh, that any investigation we have to go through in order to get at that will be worthwhile. Uh, speaking to does everyone lie and is this something that's just so pervasive that there's no escaping that, I think that that may be what we are seeing. Uh, however, I would counter by uh, responding that there's lots of truth-telling going on out there as well. And of course, the old saying goes, we're always going to hear much more about the negative than we hear about the positive. So once again, I'm not going to push that moral fire alarm uh, in the face of this lying. I'm going to say that's, that we're just simply seeing the bad seeds rather than the good apples in the barrel. Well, I, I, I think that lying, in a way, has become institutionalized. I mean, that's my focus today, the, the, in, the institutionalization is a process. And if uh, President Reagan is known as the Teflon president, in other words, a person who can get away with anything in terms of if it's valid or not. But who allows our charismatic president to get away with things if he indeed does? It's the people. And so it, it gets back to society in terms of putting the onus on each of us. Our, our democracy will not survive if we're not an active society in terms of the thought processes. 
And another point is that relationships, good relationships, good institutions are not built on fudging things or lying. It's built upon honesty. Mm -hmm. Even in this day and time, successful institutions are the ones that are honest institu institutions because that's how relationships are built, whether it's marriage or, or institutions, which is another institution, of course. We're down to our last couple of minutes, Angie. You got your bombshell you want to drop on us now? I've got this philosophical nuclear explosion that I hope will happen today, and I will submit this to my learned colleagues and open it up for your response. My contention today is that lying uh, would have no compelling nature at all and, in fact, would not exist if it were not the case that truth-telling is still a strong uh, American virtue. It's still a strong human characteristic. Uh, lying would have no chance of survival if we were not truth lovers. What makes us gullible to the lie, what makes us the corporate dupe or the political patsy is our faith in truth. In other words, Seek the truth, and the truth will make you free. Seek the truth, period, John. I'm not going to talk uh, about what the result might be. All I would submit today is that truth is alive and well, and the prevalence of lying, I believe, speaks to that, perhaps in a paradoxical way, but speaks to that nevertheless. So, too, I think corporations are waking up to the fact that this is a serious problem in the United States, that people have such a low trust of corporate executives, not only corporate executives, but people that work for corporations, and they are doing something about it. Uh, it is healthy, I think, as you mentioned earlier, that, in fact, those of us in the news business said, try to avoid the word cynicism because that implies a disbelief. Uh, we, we talk about a healthy skepticism where I doubt what you say and I'm going to verify it. We're out of time. You can believe that. <laughs> Thanks to our panelists, Angie Cooksey, to Kathy Howard, and to John Rouse for his commentary here today. I'm Larry Law. Thank you for joining us. If you have comments regarding this program, please address them to John Rouse, Box 149, Muncie, Indiana, 47305. The producer for Public Affairs Roundtable is John Rouse. Associate producers are Mike Seaborg, Bill Mosier, Nancy Carlson, and Steve Johnson. This program is a production of University Media Services and the Department of Political Science. Facilities and funding are provided by University Media Services on the campus of Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana.